My name's uh, Peter Phillips. Um, I was born in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts at 2 a.m. at the Mount Auburn Hospital. What date? Uh, on August 7th, 1935. Tell me a little bit about your mom and dad. Uh, my mom was uh, a New Hampshire girl and my dad was a uh, Cape Cod man. Yeah, he grew up on the water. My grandfather was a carpenter and built boats. And uh, my mother uh, was the daughter of a, I don't know if I could say a lumberjack or what he was, but he eventually evolved into a heating and oil business in New Hampshire. And so we had, uh, they were both from independent uh, companies of their, their, of their parents. And uh, they both met at Tufts University, uh, and uh, my father graduated in 1932, my mother in 1934, and I was born in 1935. And you have two siblings? And I have uh, my sister, uh, who was born a year and four days after I was in 1936, and my brother 10 years later in 1945, and his name's David, okay. pa and Pamela is my sister. Okay. So your dad was, what kind of business was he in? Well, he, he went to work. Uh, he had to find a job in the Depression, which when he graduated in 32, he went to work for the Shell Oil Company uh, pumping gas at a local gas station in the in the what they call the Fens way of Boston, not not far from Soxfield. And he eventually stayed with them until um, I would say 1950-ish roughly. And uh, uh, he eventually became a sales engineer. I think that was his title and he sold uh, oil products all through the war years. Uh, he was a salesman. Uh, and uh, he uh, called on various factories and selling them cell oil products. Uh, and uh, that's primarily what he did. When he left there, he, he went to work for a textile machinery company where he sold large textile machinery products to various uh, businesses throughout New York State and New England of all have all moved down south. Uh, eventually, he, he retired okay. from that particular company. Uh, tell me a little bit about your, your mom and dad, their characteristics, how they raised you. My, my dad was a, a stern man. I was a little bit afraid of him, um, unfortunately. So it kind of inhibited our conversation, but we, we tried hard together. Um, but he... He was very much a family man. Uh, he could have taken many promotions elsewhere in the country with Shell Oil and he refused. He always wanted to stay in New England. I'd like to feel that it was because of us children. He wanted to keep situated in this small town. I've called it a hamlet in some witnesses and it was a hamlet. It was only about uh, 600 people. It was a lovely, upbringing in this town where, you know, we moved there when I was six and we left when I was 13. And uh, so uh, that was my dad. Uh, he was a tall, slim, athletic man. He was a runner and a boxer in college. Um, my mother uh, was, well, I like to say that she was brilliant. She was a Phi Beta Kappa from Tufts. Uh, she loved poetry and music. Uh, well, my father was a natural musician. He played by ear. So uh, we had a lot of music in our house. Um, we had an upright, grand, uh, upright piano and he would play, uh, he learned how to play boogie woogie after World War II. And, and once he got it down, uh, he couldn't read music, but once he got it down, everything that he ever had Played, always had kind of a little boogie beat to it, All right. uh, which was really fun. I mean, we used to, we were always encouraging him to play the piano. I think he got tired of us kids saying, Dad, play the piano. <laughs> but um, we always had a piano and uh, he would play. Eventually he ended up 
after he was widowed, uh, buying a little ham and organ, and he'd play in the dining room where he. No kidding. Uh, by himself for his own entertainment, that sort of like thing. A, a Hammond B3? Or? Uh, it wasn't a big one. It was one of the, I, I, I guess it's a spinet or something. Okay. It was one of these about this big and that wide. Okay. Uh, Those are great, great instruments. Great sound. Great sound. It's great, the, great the sound. The B3 is my favorite instrument mm -hmm. of all time. It's beautiful. Oh, really? It's beautiful. So where did you graduate high school? Well, I flunked out of Orange High School at freshman, so considerable sacrifice of the family. They sent me off to prep school. I had to go to a summer school so I could even qualify to be going to sophomore. So I went to New Hampton School in New Hampshire, which is just about dead center uh, of the state uh, near Ashland right around the, the Laconia, Weirs, uh, the big lake region up there. I went there for three years and uh, um, was an average student. I, got, uh, I loved history, so all my history classes, no matter where I went, I always got A's, but I was a terrible math student. <laughs> So you're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where I got my D's and uh, took trigonometry twice. So I struggled with it, but I got through this. Uh, I got through, and it and uh, and I was accepted uh, to go to a business school uh, called Babson uh, in Wellesley, Mass. And of course, that's where I met my wife. So but that was my schooling. Let me go back, if you don't mind me asking. No. Why did you flunk out of? Freshman year, were you just not applying yourself, or were you? Well, I would say that, that it was a, it was both. Okay, <laughs> one one I one I just I I remember going into the kitchen and saying to my parents, "You really need to send me to uh, military school." I think I even then I kind of felt I wasn't disciplined enough. Okay. But they ended up sending me to this. I remember the. Uh, a uh, man from, from the school, from the New Hampton, came down, and it was not a military school. It was just a regular liberal arts type college, but it was really great. I had great instructors, uh, and uh, classes were like eight, nine, ten people, that was all. So uh, we all learned well. That's great. So now you're in Babson? I went to Babson College, uh, which is in Wellesley. Uh, it's a, was they, it was 21 hours or more per semester, and there were three semesters. So they jammed four years into three when I was there. Oh, wow. Now it's a four-year college, but um, I did the three years uh, in, at Babson, uh, and uh, uh, I was, again, an average student. Um, I took... Uh, uh, statistics and of course uh, Earl Bowen, Dr. Bowen, he, he said, I, if, to this day I remember him saying, statistics never lie, <laughs> just statisticians, they lie. <laughs> it was a good place for me to be. And uh, so I went to college there and uh, I met my wife uh, she was a waitress at Howard Johnson's restaurant um, down uh, near Wellesley College, and I'd go and buy a 10-cent cup of coffee and leave her a 50-cent tip and right. walk back to college. All right. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. So tell so, me a little bit about your courtship then. Well, besides uh, the 50-cent tips. Uh, besides the 50-cent tips. Well, <laughs> she was... Uh, she was a great prankster or jokester, and she came from an Irish Scott family, primarily Scott, but there was a, an Ellen Murray in there somewhere, and one of the, I think her grandmother was an Ellen Murray, so she had this Irish uh, wit, and uh, she would pull pranks on me. She said, we're going to go for a walk today. And I said, wow, that's wonderful. And then she'd take me through the woods, through all the brambles. And I, she did this deliberately because I always showed up on the dates with a 
jacket tie and the whole thing. Uh -huh. She was trying to get me to be a little bit more uh, easy about it. And so we walked <laughs> along the Charles River through all the trees and the brambles and everything else, getting messed up. And eventually I learned just to show up in a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and did you, her name is Elizabeth? Well, then she would call herself Betty Ann, and okay. that was, and I have to say, her she spelled it B-E-T-T-E dash A-N-N-E. Okay. Uh, okay. That's how she, that was something she started in high school. About the last 10 years of her life, she said, I'm now a grown-up, I'm Elizabeth, from <laughs> now on. And I said, <laughs> I okay, uh, I'll start it. calling you Elizabeth then. So during our courtship and most of our marriage, it was Betty Ann. A lot of our friends know her as Betty Ann. Uh, and uh, she, uh, uh, we did go, we would get on the bus and we'd go into uh, uh, Boston. Uh, she, before she met me, she used to travel to a place called The Stables, which was a jazz club downstairs. And uh, there was somebody by the name of Serge Shaloff, who I guess, is a well-known saxophonist okay. and uh, he was actually there and she was kind of quasi dating a pianist named uh, Ray Santisi. Uh, but uh, anyway we would go down there and uh, I was 20 and she was 21 and she would drink her beer and she says no you can't have a beer because you're not 21 yet. That was the kind of thing <laughs> she did to me you know. Well, let me have, buy me what? No, no, no. <laughs> she was a big tease, and then we'd get on the bus and we'd go back to uh, to Wellesley, and uh, or we'd walk along the Charles. I used to love walking along the Charles with her down there because it's uh, they have the Esplanade and the big band shell and everything else. It's very rich in its history. Yeah, a lot. To right see. across from where I was born. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in Cambridge. Our dates, we would babysit for one of her cousins, and uh, she would iron all my shirts, and so that was just by being able to do my wash and uh, and iron my shirts was was how we got to. Uh, uh, that was our payment for uh, for babysitting, so her cousin and her his wife could uh, get out and. And go to the jazz club. Go to go right? go to the jazz club themselves <laughs> or something. Great. So, so, how did you propose to her? You know, I almost think it was like osmosis. I didn't get down on my knee or anything, uh, but I did go to uh, a place. Uh, I can't think of the jewelry place, but she knew the jeweler place, and she'd already picked out her diamond. Okay. And it was almost like. It was automatic. Yeah. Uh, I would say within uh, six months or to, to a year, we were just talking about our kids. We had some crazy names like Storm and that uh, for our kids' names, you know, <laughs> Storm, uh, which we, of course, all of the kids became Junior or Peter or, right, right. or Melissa, named after. Uh, other relatives. Okay. Uh, Melissa is named after her grandmother, uh, Betty Ann's mother, and Mary Ann's named after the mother's twin sister, who was Mary Ann. Okay. So, uh, and uh, Peter was me, and John, I don't know why John to this day says, you should have called me Ian. I, I would have much preferred the Scotch name Ian. <laughs> <laughs> So we uh, we chuckle over that a little bit, but yeah, my my dad used to call me Seamus. Seamus. Yeah, you know, James. Uh, For James. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Did uh, you know you were in trouble? Yeah. yeah usually, actually, he was a, he was kind of a joker too. So yeah. When, right. When he called me Seamus, usually it was uh, in the context of trying to be funny. So I. I <laughs> He didn't talk when he was mad, so that's yeah, when right. I knew I was going to get well, it. Well, that's you. you did, I had the same thing with my dad. When I said he was a stern man, he never shouted at us. He just stopped talking. Yeah. yeah. And I, when 
When Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came out, there was four of us kids from town. We're in the city of Worcester. We live north of Worcester. We went to see it, and then we said, let's stay and watch the... So we stayed up until the witch showed up, which, meanwhile, my dad is circulating around the block, <laughs> and uh, I can remember saying, uh, when he didn't say anything to us when we came out. We got into the car, didn't say anything all the way home, and the kids started talking, and I said, shh, 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 he's mad. He's not talking. <laughs> but... Um, so, anyway. so you were married, what year? I was married in 1957, right after I graduated from Babson. Okay, and you went into the Marines. Were you, were you drafted, or how did that happen? Well, during that time, this was, of course, during the Cold War, and there was, always, and there was a draft. And so there was always that worry or nagging thing when I was in college that, I might get drafted and maybe I should join. And there was this feller and I who were kind of buds at Babson and he said, I'm going to join the Marines. And I said, all right. So we went down and unbeknownst to my future wife, I signed up to go into office at candidate school <laughs> in September of 1957, which she found out after we were married that I was going away in September. Oh. Yes. You left uh, that part out. I left that part out. <laughs> and uh, so there were times when she was justifiably mad at me, or at least the way, you know, when I did <laughs> stupid things like that without keeping her informed. So I did join the Marine Corps. Uh, John Wood, who uh, was going to go with me, uh, turned out to be 4F for some reason or another. So. I went by myself, and that's a great story, you know. There was a bunch of us on the train from Boston down to Quantico, Virginia, and uh, there was a couple guys that get off with their golf clubs and so forth, and of course the DI. <laughs> I can remember him screaming to this day <laughs> at those what guys. He, what did he say? Where do you think this is? A country club? <laughs> What's the matter with you guys? He pitched all those clubs right into the nearest dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway. Yeah, this is no vacation. This is no vacation, and it wasn't. Um, I'm not sure. I can't. I can't. Uh, there was one feller in our class who, when he was accepted as to be a candidate, when joined the Marine Corps uh, down in, uh, uh, so he could go through Paris Island. He was the only one that knew Paris Island and could make a comparison between the two boot camps. And uh, he always felt that uh, the, um, uh, there was more athletic requirements on the part for the officers. We, we used to do 21 to uh, to uh, 30 mile hikes and uh, that sort of thing, and we did a lot of uh, a lot of uh, walking in the woods and running in the woods. And then, one of the expressions that I I think I've mentioned to my kids is that uh, I was I was heavy uh, even then. I've been heavy most of my life, and uh, I got a kind of a backhanded compliment. The guy, the DI said, if Fat Phillips can make it through this run, you guys can make it run through oh, the And I think, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. How many years were you in the Marine Corps? I was in for um, just under four years active duty and about four years of uh, reserve duty. Okay. Uh, and then when we moved out here, I, um, I, was more concentrating on the family, and I so I did not. Uh, there and there was nothing around here. For instance, my son-in-law now has to go all the way to Ohio to to some kind of a reserve meeting, and I okay. wasn't prepared to do that kind of thing. Okay, just to be a Marine. So I just uh, eventually I was asked to resign my commission okay. of inactivity, and that's how it ended in about 1967. Okay. So you you never went to war. I never was at war. It, career ended in fifty two, fifty three, or the truce was signed. Okay. Vietnam was just starting to begin, 
by the time that uh, I did volunteer. Uh, another thing I did without telling my wife. <laughs> I volunteered to go back on active duty and they said you have, um, for your particular uh, rank, you do not have any uh, experience. Uh, so uh, they did not accept my uh, request. What, what, what prompted you to do that, Peter? Was it because of the uh, be, Vietnam War? Because of the Vietnam because of, uh, well, it was because of the media. You know, the media really was talking about how, how desperate things were over there and that sort of thing. And, uh, and it was just part of uh, wanting to be with, there's some kind of a camaraderie uh, that uh, comes with being in the military and especially in the Marines. Mm -hmm. And you want to be with your men. You want to be with, uh, and that was one of the things that I probably enjoyed the most about the Marine Corps was dealing with, you know, about 50 men uh, in a platoon right. and uh, doing things together. Were you disappointed that you couldn't make it? Yeah, I was disappointed. I was disappointed that, uh, but uh, I got a very nice letter from the Commandant of the Marine Corps saying something to the effect that sometimes the biggest sacrifice a military man has to make is standing down when asked to do so. Mm. Wow. It, was, it was well phrased by General Chapman and uh, said he hoped that I would uh, continue to, you know, promote the Marines, mm -hmm. which I do. I belong to the, I'm a life member of what they call the uh, of 801, uh, the Marine Corps League here in Lake County. Okay. And uh, I don't get to their meetings much anymore, but they do have a meeting once a month and uh, uh, they just promote the Marine Corps legacy. What year did you and, and Betty Ann move to uh, Illinois and what brought you here? Uh, we moved here in uh, 1967. And uh, again, 1967, remember the Queen talked about her year of how, uh, the Latin word for being very horrible. She had one of those horrible years with them. Windsor Castle, Bert, that was a bad year for us. Because okay. it started out with a lie. I said I had an opportunity and they wanted me to move to Chicago. Actually, I had volunteered to move to Chicago. <laughs> I said, I want to go to Chicago. <laughs> uh, why did I want to go to Chicago? I can remember driving down Lakeshore Drive at a, we were at a school or something. I was, and uh, that was being sponsored by the uh, company I worked uh, in Evanston, and I just thought, what a lovely place this is. Look at the lake. And that's what I used to tell Betty Ann. I would say, the lake is marvelous. You'll just love it. Well, of course, uh, how we ended up in Libertyville is interesting. She was so upset during 1967 that she never even fixed up the house that we lived in in Des Plaines. Uh, the living room was nothing more than a storage area. Um, but she was a great fan of Ed Light Stevenson, and Stevenson was well regarded on the East Coast. Uh, and uh, so when she found out that there was a little cottage for sale up in Libertyville, a ranch home, she said, we're moving to Libertyville. End of subject. We, so right. we moved to Libertyville. <laughs> you and brought me here. You, I'm going to pick where I want to <laughs> live. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. So we moved, and we stayed in that. Uh, we stayed there. We we moved in there in May of 1968. Uh, and uh, Marianne still lives in the same house she was raised in. She bought the house from me in uh, uh, 2012. Okay. And uh, so she and her husband live in the house, and they've uh, fixed it up very nicely and even added a garage and that sort of thing. 
So, so let ahead. me take you back for a second to the early 60s because you were li you know, born and, and raised out east. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the topics mm -hmm. that comes up with the interviews that George and I are doing here uh, is around the early 60s. So much happened in the 60s. Yes. You know? uh, Martin, Bobby, obviously mm -hmm. Jack Kennedy. Where were you and what was the impact on, on you and your family when President Kennedy was assassinated? Do you recall? Well, it was a wonderful, it was, when he talks, when they talk about Camelot, it was like, especially for Bostonians, it was like Camelot. It was, you know, we just had this wonderful, comfortable feeling. One of our own was in the White House. Um, and he was a young president, and uh, it, it, it was just a, almost a serene feeling in 63. I, I can remember that area at that time because my grandmother died in 62, John F. Kennedy died in 63, and my mother died in 64. Oh boy. So, you know, I can always pinpoint that 63. I was sitting in my office, uh, I was a sales administrator for this particular company, and um, uh, somebody came running up and said, somebody shot uh, President Kennedy. And we all, almost the whole building, we were on the top floor of the building and there was showrooms underneath us. We all went into the basement where the supply room was because it was the only radio in the whole building. Wow. And that's when we, so I was sitting in the basement of this old uh, Bostonian mansion that we had for a, for a company office uh, when we heard the news. Uh, I called my wife and she said, please come home. And I said, okay. And uh, so uh, I came, we got, and I went to the, my boss and I said, well, I'm going to have to go home. And he says, maybe we should close the office. And he closed the office. And uh, we all went home. And um, uh, so we spent the, the next uh, two or three, four days just watch, glued to the television. We had a television. And it was a very, very old television. We watched the whole funeral, and I'll never, never forget the drum beats, you know. And uh, when they were taking him to Arlington, and um, taking President Kennedy to Arlington, and we kept hearing, don't say the president's dead, because the president isn't dead. Our president lives on. You say President Kennedy is dead. Uh, I'm not sure if there was something in the Boston Globe about that, I think. So we watched all of that thing. I went upstairs to be with the children for some reason or another, and there was a blood-curdling scream come down from downstairs. I went around, running downstairs. I said, what's the matter, Betty? Somebody shot Oswald. <laughs> Oh jeez. So she um, she she watched it happen right on the screen and wow. apparently a lot a lot of people did in the country saw him executed by Ruby. Right. Uh, so uh, that it had to feel just unhinged. Well, it was it was it was just this what we were wondering what is going on in the world. I mean, we 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 think of today what is going on? Well, it was the same way back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. What is going on? We were just absolutely devastated by the loss of, of uh, and then of course, then, the, then we thought we, we had high hopes when Robert was going to run. Right. And then he was, uh, we never qu quite, there wasn't the same impact as it was with a president in the right. White House, but uh, Mr. King was assassinated, of course, uh, I thought in the summer because we were, I was working on 12th Street at the time. I had an office on 12th Street with about six people and uh, 12th Street? Uh, Roosevelt Road in uh, Chicago. Okay. Uh, Roosevelt and Damon, which is sure. right across from the, uh, the uh, hospital complex. Uh, we heard that um, Mr. King had been assassinated and uh, 
I said, oh my word, you know, another thing. And then at about two o'clock, I said, we're closing the office. And so we closed the office. I hopped on the bus um, and uh, I trans went down, I went down Adams, I went down Ashland Avenue to Adams, changed at Adams and went, went to the train station from there. Uh, a gang of uh, people went through the corner of Adams and Ashland and a lot of shops were destroyed. Strange as it may seem, I play cards with a woman today who had a bridal shop right there in that corner wow. and lost her whole shop uh, on that, that day. And uh, it's funny how those things come back to you yeah. like that. Uh, so anyway, uh, I got on the train and, and got home and uh, uh, you know, hugged my wife and said, well, things will, things will have to get better. Yeah. But like she said, she, I remember her saying distinctly during the JFK, maybe things will be, get better now. And, uh, and they never did. Yeah. I mean, they just. It was a rough time with yeah. Vietnam and. With the had Vietnam going on, and it just got progressive. I watched the whole Vietnam thing. I tried to understand how did we ever get into that, and I never quite understood how we. And they had that Vietnam Ken Burns. Oh, it's wonderful. Same. So I said, well, at least now I know how we yeah. got into it. It's very complicated. Yeah, yeah. it was, and uh, so uh, it was hard to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, this, what's the saying? You know, it's easy to get into war. It's, it's very hard to get out. Yeah, it has, boy, did Vietnam prove that. I learned a lot by that documentary. It was extremely yes, well done. Yeah. Ken Burns is a really a, a American treasure in my isn't, opinion. Isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I see, that was Peter, my son Peter. He was, surprisingly, he was a conservative historian. So he wasn't well loved by his fellow historians because he was conservative. but. That was the kind of thing that he loved was those kind of documentaries. And if he'd lived, I think he would have maybe gotten into something like that. Well, tell me a little bit about Peter. Well, Peter was a, kind of an easygoing guy. He was a great prankster and a trickster and tricker. He always <laughs> he always was playing tricks. You know, sounds like he got that from his mother. Well. Of course, it came back to haunt her many times. <laughs> like, I'd get a call saying, Peter's disappeared. <laughs> Come home. We've got to find Peter. <laughs> and we, at the, we were living there, uh, you know, on, uh, just on uh, Arlington Drive, and there was the bridge right over the river. We, were, we had a little bridge that went over into the Adler Park area, and Peter would just scoot over that bridge and into the park and he'd go up and sit in the tree. And he'd see all of us walking around, Peter, Peter, where are you? And he's sitting up in the tree laughing at us. <laughs> he was the kind of guy, I'm going to learn how to feed myself, Dad. And he goes out and buys all this expensive bow and arrow stuff so they can go out and shoot a deer. Okay. So that that's how he was going to feed himself. And by gosh, he got up in the tree again with his bow and arrow and all along comes a doe and a stag and he sees his family and he says, how can I shoot those animals? So he never did. He came down from the tree. He came down from the tree and he never shot any deer. And he was the kind of guy that, you know, if, 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 if something could cause him problems, it would cause him problems. He's driving along, he's got, he doesn't have Remember we had to have those safety tags that we went through with, with our automobile? Uh, you have to have that. And if you don't have that, then he ignored it. And of course his tag was revoked uh, because of it. So of course they, he did something or some tail light was broken or something on his van. And so they stopped him. And, and I can still remember that. The, he says, the police, the police said, what is this thing you've got in there? He had a big bucket of urine, which for deer urine, which he never threw up, was from his deer hunting. Oh boy. 
tear hunting escapades. Yeah, don't touch that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, I mean, that was the kind of thing that he, he, you know, he almost had to laugh at some of the happenstances that he ran into. <laughs> I guess, you know, like he burnt himself on something when I took him to the office one time in, in Chicago and uh, he was kind of, I said, come on, we'll have to go ho right home. So we went home, but um, I put a lot of water on it and stuff, but he was whimpering on the train and, uh, and uh, the conductor said, come with me. And we took him right into the engine and smeared oil all, all really? over the bird. Came back, it was fine. <laughs> didn't, didn't feel another pain. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, we took him to the doctor and and he fixed him up. Fixed him up. Yeah. But he, 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 he was, you know, constantly running into those kind of problems. Now, Peter passed away what year? He died in uh, 2007. Uh, it was, I was going to go to a meeting uh, in Lake Bluff uh, on a Monday night, and uh, it was in uh, July, and uh, I said, I don't feel like going to that meeting, and so I didn't go to that meeting, so I was home when the council of Belize, where he lived, uh, where he was teaching school, uh, called to say that uh, uh, he had died. Uh, that he'd been murdered, and uh, uh, I, c I remember going to, I remember calling Mary Ann, and Mary, Mary Ann started crying terribly, and her husband, uh, Carrie at the time, said, what's the matter, and she couldn't talk, and I said, I have to go. I had to tell her, so I said, because I, I have to go and tell your mother. And I can remember walking in. She had just gone into Winchester House for the first time, she, you know, uh, as a patient and resident. And I stood at the door, and she said, what a wonderful surprise. It was 8.30, and I burst into sobs and crying. She looked at me, and all she said was, which one? Which one? And uh, knowing that one of the children had died, and, and of course it was Peter. And uh, uh, so anyway, it was we we the 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 woman Mary Ann will remember her name. I can never remember her name, but she was just a wonderful person. Um, Marianne has got a mind, you know, she remembers everything. Um, that's her business, that's her stock and trade. Well, of course, that's Melissa's stock and trade, too, <laughs> both of them. And uh, they, uh, uh, she said, we'll t we can take care of most of the things here. And, they, and Peter was, I, on, by Friday of that week, Peter was, back in the United States at Burnett Dane. Uh, and uh, Melissa uh, and I went to the library and she composed some kind of a um, obituary. She composed the obituary entirely, Melissa did. And uh, she's also the one that gave a marvelous eulogy and uh, uh, at his, uh, Funeral. Well, Mary Ann did too, to tell you the truth. I'm getting a little mixed up. We had it because he was so much of a reborn again Christian. Okay. Uh, that we did not have a Catholic because he was not a Catholic anymore. Okay. And I, I, as, as much as I wanted to have a Catholic, it would have been for me, but it wouldn't have been for any of his friends or, or even his brother and sister because uh, of 
all four children at one time did not go to church, and then Melissa started coming back with me okay. uh, to church. Uh, and you know, Catholicism was was the thing that I I was a, a Protestant. I grew up a Protestant, and but it was uh, being a Catholic was what I looked for. I uh, was looking for, and um, was Betty Ann Catholic? Yes, she was. Yeah, okay. She was a cradle Catholic, and uh, in fact, she went to Boston College's first class of women in 1953. And wow. Melissa has a picture of her and Cardinal Cushing and two other co-eds walking along the Boston College campus. That's where she was going to school at the time. Uh, and uh, anyway, she was a cradle Catholic, and. Uh, uh, and, and that helped me. I, I really liked my roommate in prep school who was a Catholic, Peter. He was a Peter, too. I uh, can't remember his last name. Uh, anyway, uh, he was always uh, very, very firm in his beliefs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I admired him for it. Yeah, so anyway, Peter, we, we, had, the, we had it at the church at the Protestant churches where he and John used to go together. Okay. Uh, they loved uh, the minister and the pastor that was there. At, it's on Winchester Road. I think it's called Horizon or something else the now. Chapel? No, it wasn't the chapel. This was, uh, the chapel was after, okay. Okay. Was, came after Peter was, uh, had passed away. Um, it was, um, but anyway, they, uh, they, that's where they used to go. It was right there. Uh, early, it's the first church uh, on the on the north side of Winchester Road after you've gone past the uh, oh yeah uh, Winchester House, uh, and uh, so that's where he had his his funeral, okay. and that's where all of his friends came, and uh, five of his buddies got up and and uh, talked and. Uh, uh, Chris Garrison was his BFF. Yeah. <laughs> if if there was one, they went. They joined the Marines together, and uh, Chris and another one. I think his name was Ryan. Chris Ryan. Um, those two Chris's uh, purchased Peter's uh, headstone, or actually it was a bench, so they'd come sit and talk to Peter. Wow. I've come across Chris Garrison weeding around his uh, monument uh, at Lakeside. Uh, wow. All three of them used to hang out in Lakeside, so that's why Peter's at Lakeside. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the hill, overlooking the high school. All right. uh, and uh, so, but Chris, I, you know, Chris Garrison there, uh, putting plants in and, and doing all God those. God bless him. Wonderful things, yeah. So, uh, so your faith is? Uh, do you go to mass every day? I was very, very good about mass every day, off and on. I, over the years since 1968, when my wife fell in love with St. Joe, she says, "You should see that church, you know, <laughs> up here in Libertyville." So. Um, uh, off and on over the years, uh, uh, one of the things that I used to do when I was working in the city from uh, uh, till 1980, from about uh, 70 to 80, I used to get off at the Edgebrook Station, walk down Devon to the Basilica, okay. and attend Mass there. And uh, it was during that time when we had uh, Pope John Paul I, uh, the November Pope, okay. when I was attending there. and. Uh, uh, and then I would go sometimes to St. Joe's, and lately I've been a slacker. I haven't, uh, well. <laughs> I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten <laughs> the daily mass the way I should. Uh, a long time I went to, I went to twelve o'clock at Marytown. Okay. Uh, and um, when I heard that Father Ivas was giving eight thirty mass every time, and I thought, well, I've got to go to. St. Joe's, so I started going at 8.30 to, so I could listen to Father Ivers because his homilies were always 
uh, simple and always very poignant, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you knew what he was saying, do it. <laughs> and I thought, well, that would, uh. so I, I really, I really enjoyed every one of his, his I, I would, and the mass I missed was the mass, the last mass when he left his shoes on the altar. And wouldn't you know I'd miss that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a famous mass. Yeah, that's the famous mass that I missed, or (laughs) in my point of view. And I thought, oh, gosh. But uh, anyway, um, so I missed that one. What what do you like about St. Joe's? What do you love so much about St. Joe's? I I, I don't know. There there is just something about, and and Frank, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't part, I wasn't much, I was just a Sunday, or sometimes I was a daily, depending. Uh-huh. But I wasn't involved with anybody in the church. I just came to Mass, so I said, I heard Mass, and then I'd go to work. I was very involved with my wife, and then it wasn't until my wife passed away in 2011 that I really started to start doing things with the men in St. Okay. Joe's. And, um, I'm not trying to take away from the parish that's, that governs my particular area in Vernon Hills now, St. Mary Vernon, but uh, I've gone to their masses. I've taken a woman there on Saturday night uh, during the summer and uh, when it doesn't get dark. And, uh, but there's even, Joe Curtis, the pastor, sure. God bless him, is a, Joe, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is a great, great guy, but there's still something about St. Joe's uh, that I just, going to Mass there and, you know, Father Trout has continued, Father Hennessy's. Uh, um, I once told Father Hennessy, I saw him at the hospital when Elizabeth was so sick in those last years. I said, you know, we're really blessed. I said, we've got three priests, and every one of them gave marvelous homilies, and they <laughs> did every all three of them. I'm not sure whether it's the word that is being said, and of course, Father Trout has taken that legacy of Father Hennessy's and and uh, continued it. I don't know if you saw it. He's <laughs> I loved Father <laughs> Father Trout. <laughs> he started talking about. 715 Mass, and he stopped dead in his tracks, and he says, I'm not sure where I'm going with this. <laughs> and the whole congregation started erupted in laughter, and then he went on, of course, and uh, he, he made his points. But, it happens uh, to everybody, right? <laughs> yeah, right, but maybe it's just being so truthful that, yeah, you know, yeah. and and all of the guys are just super great. I mean, uh, I guess my biggest feeling of guilt right now is I'm not getting to the vocations committee uh, uh, the holy. I call it the holy hour at three o'clock as much as I should, because uh, I was going pretty steadily to that okay. uh, for a while, and uh, I've got to get back to that. Okay. Uh, one way or another. Is that Thursdays, I think? That's Thursday at 3 o'clock. Yeah. And they, you know, and uh, I think there's a little blurb that says, you know, this is the holy, uh, I, and that's why I call it the holy hour, because it's something right from the capita that says this was the holy hour before Good Friday was. I want to ask you a little bit about about your work, because you ran the Liberty Theater for years. Is that correct? Well, yeah. I. I I always like to think of myself, and you know, I, it wasn't until just recently that I, when I was thinking back about all of the things that I've done over the years, I've been primarily in customer service, and that's where I've gained the most satisfaction. Liberty Theater was just one of six theater, one of six theaters that I had, uh, you know, at one time. I had four indoor theaters that uh, I worked with and uh, two outdoor theaters. During the summer, you know, forget it. I, you know, it was like 
and 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 the job was a 24/7 job. I mean, yeah. I can I smashed up a car coming back, got hit by a deer, or a Boy. deer hit me, or I hit the deer, <laughs> or something. Coming back at three o'clock from McHenry in the in the morning, McHenry Indoor Theater. Because there was a problem, and the police called and said, "You got to get over here." Oh boy! <laughs> and uh, that was the kind of thing that you know I was the go-to guy. I guess. Did you run dunes by any chance? Yes, I ran the dunes okay, I too. Lived, grew up right down the street. Ah, okay, <laughs> yeah. That was our theater. That was yeah, that was your theater, uh, and I had the dunes theater from uh, 1979 to. Um, when I retired in 2006 or 2007, wow. it was just one of the uh, one of the uh, four indoor theaters that I had. Okay. And uh, uh, we used to staff it with, uh, I, I, before the government gave all these benefits to the chiefs and uh, in, on the Navy base, I had Navy chiefs at the Liberty and uh, at oh. the Dunes. Really? Uh, as part-time, you know, managers, and sure. they did just a wonderful job. I had this wonderful fella, I think I can remember his name now on this, off the top of my head, but <laughs> he was a great guy, came from Wisconsin, and he moved back to his hometown in Wisconsin, and now I understand he's running a multiplex uh, up in the Dells area somewhere. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, but he's a retired Navy chief, okay. and... Uh, I got a call from a guy named Andy Babinski who ran, uh, he lives up in um, Racine now, that's a funny story. Um, he ran the Dunes Theater for oh, about four or five years after this other fellow left. Uh, Andy uh, was a retired Navy chief. Uh, he's used to elbowing with admirals at the, uh, at the Pentagon. He was a senior yeoman, he was really way up there. Um, and uh, he retired, and uh, and when he ret he decided he was going to get off Navy base, and he moved up to Kenosha and bought a house, and he noticed that the guy next door had all this pack of material all over his front porch, <laughs> and, and you know, well, where did I ever meet all these funny people? And he so the next thing you know, he's put all his bear stuff all over the porch, you know. So. <laughs> They're best friends today. <laughs> there you go. But anyway, I got a call from him just touching base uh, not long ago. And uh, uh, so uh, it, it worked out very well having these. Having these. But eventually uh, that kind of dwindled out. And uh, we have, uh, so we used fairly young people, depending how good they were as managers. And... Uh, uh, I think the last couple uh, ladies at the Liberty were were uh, females, and they were. I hired one of them, Bridget, and I think she's a school teacher now somewhere. Okay. And uh, uh, but it was a very satisfying job, and and really the reason uh, I took it in the first place was. I had a, a boss that, uh, who owned the theater, the Ryan family, said, just left me alone. He says, I don't want any dark screens, meaning make sure you have, always have a picture on the screen yeah. and we're getting money. Yeah, yeah. And that was his only requirement. How you do it is up to you. And, and so that was really good. And it worked out great for me because my wife in the last 20 years of her life was very sick. And she needed ride over here to this doctor over there, so forth. I could, in the middle of the day, just drop everything, go over, pick her up, take her over to the doctor, and wait for her, and bring her home. And then I could go back and finish up what I was doing, right. and that sort of thing. Whether it happened to be at the Dunes or the Antioch Theater or at the Liberty, that's why that job really worked out well for me because it was kind of a loose job, and, right. and yeah, the Ryan's family, yeah, and the Ryan family. Uh, treated us uh, well. We, we didn't. We didn't make the greatest pay in the world, but they treated us well. They provided us mm -hmm. for most. Well, for all of the time that I was there, 
I had superb uh, health care, especially for my wife, uh, at no cost. Wow. No cost. Uh, that was the kind of benefits that they provided, plus a, plus a, uh, uh, a company car. So uh, yeah. those kind of things went a long way to make uh, maybe not as much money at salary that I could have made, say, in the furniture company that I was in before I went to them full time. Uh, but so two more questions for you, Peter. One is, how would Elizabeth describe you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know how she would <laughs> describe me. She <laughs> fell in love with me and uh, she decided, she told me one time uh, when I walked in there uh, to have coffee, she said to a fellow worker, I told this fellow worker, I'm going to marry that man. Well, she made sure she married me. <laughs> so there must have been something desirable. We, uh, when I talked about 1967, it was a bad year because she was not happy out here at all. And so we had a lot of arguments and a lot of fights. And to this day, I, I hope we didn't uh, uh, mess up the kids <laughs> with the fights. But anyway. How would she describe me? Uh, I can only describe myself as kind of an easygoing guy, and I guess that's what she liked about me. Uh, Excellent. She had uh, she had some very intense relationships before me, and none of them worked out. So maybe I was the one that she needed to. Obviously, you were uh, the one. And so, on. <laughs> and in the end, I ended up. Caring for her, and I'm, I was glad I could do that. And I was there to, to take care of her. Last question for you. Have you led a happy life? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've been very happy. Even though we've had our, our tragedies, and all people, all families have their ups and their downs. And they've got tragic occurrences, you know. My mother, my, my wife, uh, my mother died at 52, you know, uh, my son. But uh, overall, it's been a wonderful life. And uh, we've been, been happy. We've done stuff together uh, as a family, I think. Uh, I've never felt the need that I had to try to be something that I'm not, which was, you know, some executive someplace, because uh, I was never good at that. Uh, so by being easygoing, I, we had an easygoing marriage, life, and uh, I thrill with my with the kids. Uh, John is, I was thrilled when he, you know, he played with his Tonker toys and now he, he's a heavy equipment operator and loves doing that kind of work. Um, both my daughters are in professions that I think they love, um, uh, you know, dealing with people. So if that's my legacy, then I'm very happy that it's going because I, I do recognize now <laughs> If I'm allowed to live 10 more years, maybe I'll see King Charles crowned in <laughs> England. <laughs> Peter, it's a pleasure being with you always. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much.